Take your Bible tonight, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to be holding our finger on verse 9 and 10 tonight. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. Tonight we're going to be preaching part one of a message entitled, Love That God Hates. Love That God Hates. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the evening. Help us to glean some important truths tonight that will help us to be better Christians. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us, but help us to understand there's some, there are certain kinds of love that you hate. So, Lord, help us to learn what it is and uh, not do it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in the last message, we took some time studying the issue of godliness and contentment and their importance in being a victorious, effective Christian for Jesus Christ. Now, in this message, we address the flip side and examine the consequences of carnality and covetousness. When you look through the scriptures, you find several things that sinners love, but God hates. Number one, God hates man's love for darkness, sin, or wickedness. John 3.19 says, And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Psalm 52.3 says, Thou lovest evil more than good, and lying rather than to speak righteousness. So as we jump into this message tonight, may we glean the truths that are here. So let's pray. Father, thank you for everything that you've done for us. We pray, Lord, that we would learn some important truths tonight that will help us to be better Christians. Help me, Lord, as I preach now. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. What else does God hate? God hates man's love for this world's sinful lifestyles, philosophies, and the destructive things that this world offers to us. 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. When he's talking about the world, though, he's talking about the philosophy, the lifestyles of this world. God also hates men who have a love for violence. Psalm 11.5. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth, the Bible says. God also ha uh, God hates men's love for money. Now look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We're going to take some time and examine these last two verses and their meaning. We will explain what these verses mean and what they don't mean. We will answer some important questions in the message that pertain to us about the issue of money. What is your attitude to be about money? Uh, is, is money evil? What are the consequences of being addicted and consumed in acquiring riches? Do you have a grip on your money or does your money have a grip on you? So let's get started. Look at the fall, verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. So Paul, he does something here. He offers a warning about the woes of those who are consumed and pursue the goal at any cost to be wealthy. 
If you do not have wisdom in handling and acquiring your money, you will become a fool for sure and make some very destructive decisions. The security you seek will leave you insecure. The will to become rich has led to the graveyards of broken marriages and families, addictions, imprisonment, and death, to name a few. Children have been neglected because mom and dads were too concerned about becoming wealthy instead of providing a loving home and spending time with their kids. The choices made by these parents are not made out of necessity or want, but just the pursuit to be rich. The word will that's used here is from the word bulomai, which means to will deliberately, to have a purpose, to be minded or to desire. Now, beloved, if God blesses your family financially, then praise His dear name for it. There is nothing wrong with that or working hard to take care for yourself or to take care of your family. There's nothing wrong with starting a business to care for the needs of your family. Nothing wrong with that. The getting rich at all cost mentality is what is condemned here by the Apostle Paul. If you live just to be rich, if your consuming desire, purpose, and goal in life is to hoard money, to accumulate as much of it as you can and satisfy your greed, then Houston, we have a problem. That was the idiom phrase of the 1970 Apollo 13 astronaut Jack Swigert when he radioed the NASA Mission Control Center in Houston about a serious explosion that occurred on the spaceship. Some folks know how to handle wealth without it controlling them and dominating them. Abraham and Job were two examples. Lot, Ananias, and Sapphira were examples of people who could not handle wealth. If money has a grip on you, then you are in trouble and you are heading for more trouble in your life. Understand you are heading for disappointment because money cannot satisfy you and it can't satisfy anybody else. Many times it creates more problems for you. The Romans had a proverb that said, wealth is like seawater. So far from quenching a man's thirst, it intensifies it. King Solomon was one of the wealthiest men of his day. And he said in Proverbs 15, 27, He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house. Psalm 62, 10 says, If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. Uh, you know, Luke 12, 15 says, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Ecclesiastes 5.10, Solomon says, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. King Solomon made it clear in Ecclesiastes 5.10 that money cannot bring you satisfaction in your life. It's just not going to happen. 
Uh, it's like the man who said last month, my aunt died and left me $25,000. Last week, my brother died and he left me $38,000. I'm so depressed. Well, his good friend said, what? why are you so depressed? And he said, because this week nobody died. Now, that's pretty pathetic, <laughs> isn't it? Greed makes you cold and insensitive. It leaves you empty, begging for more. When you think money, uh, what you think money will do for you, in many cases, it can't. The desire for wealth is an illusion. Money will buy a bed, but it will not buy you sleep. It buys books, but not brains. It buys food, but not an appetite. It buys a house, but not a home. It buys medicine, but not health. It buys amusements, but not happiness. It can buy a passport to just about everywhere except heaven. Uh, it cannot buy you love or preserve you from sorrow or death. Security which is founded on, on material things is foredoomed to failure. Paul warned that if your constant, continual desire is to covet money, if that is all you think about, you are heading for a fall. That is understandable because people who covet money will do almost anything to get it. In fact, some will even rob God of his tithes and offerings. See, when the Christian, when the believer robs the Lord of what belongs to him, then there are serious repercussions that come from the Lord. Achan knew what that was all about. Notice what Malachi said about what happens when you give uh, to the Lord as well as rob the Lord of tithes and offerings. What Malachi states is very relevant for today. Now here's what he said in Malachi 3 verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yes, he will, unfortunately. Well, he says, yet you have robbed me, but you say, well, wherein have we robbed thee? And then he says, in tithes and offerings. Then he says this. A lot of people don't catch this. You are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. So he says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now, herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour, pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Man, what a promise from God that still is in effect for today. Giving plays an important part in the spiritual growth of the Christian because it is in this area where some of his greatest battles are fought and great victories and blessings are received. In fact, in a recent survey in Discipleship Journal, it revealed that the number one area of the greatest spiritual challenge for Christians was the battle that they had with materialism. And this is so true. You know, I think of the story about the parents who said of their son, We were very proud 
of our nearly two-year-old son who was learning to say please and thank you after he opened various gifts from friends at Christmas. We asked little Zachary, what do you say to Diana and Alexandra? And Zachary responded, more please. We have all wrestled with the more please syndrome. Humans have it even when they are infants. When it comes to the matter of money, I have seen more people get out of church and rob God because of their thirst for money and for material possessions that cannot satisfy them at all. So many have lost the joy of their salvation because they are gripped with greed like a moth in a spider's web. Lust for money, it will destroy your life. The excitement that it generates is a factor in why people are gripped by money and what it can do for them. You know, the story is told of a man who had a heart attack and was rushed to the hospital. He could receive little company and was not to be excited while in the hospital, a rich uncle died and left this man one million dollars. His family wondered how to break the news to him with the least amount of excitement. So it was decided that they would ask his pastor to go and break the news to him quietly the best that he could. So the pastor went into the hospital room and gradually led up to the question. The pastor asked the man what he would do if he inherited a million dollars. And the man said, you know what, pastor? I think I would give half of the money to the church. That's what I do. And when the pastor heard that, he dropped dead from excitement. <clears throat> yes, money does have a way of exciting people. Don't let the thrill of money destroy you. Paul warned that wealth can lead to falling. If you have ever watched the nightly news, you most likely have see, seen people who were interviewed who were robbed by thieves. They were distraught, they were discouraged, or they felt defeated by what happened to them. Well, that is the idea behind this word fall that's used right here. It's from the word emptipto. And one of its meanings is to fall among robbers or to fall into something such as a pit. The areas where those who grasp for riches can fall, they are threefold. We're going to look at one area tonight. The first one is seduction or temptation. Look at verse 9 again. But they that will be rich fall into temptation. Those who are gripped by greed will fall into temptation, Paul says. In fact, the word fall here is in the present tense, which means this kind of person continually, over and again, falls into temptation. The temptations don't quit. The person is constantly getting tricked, trapped, tested, tried, and troubled. In fact, the word temptation here is from the word perismos. And in classical Greek, it referred to a medical test that would prove either health or disease. This word refers to a test or a trial that either proves the goodness of a person or it's an enticement or solicitation to fail and fall into sin. 
Beloved, we are tested to see if we are sincere and whether we really are who we profess to be. That's why God allows tests in our life. How many of you within the last year have gone through some tests? Would you raise your hand? God allows those in our life for a reason. You know, Thomas Watson, the great preacher, said, The devil tempts that he may deceive, but God suffers or allows us to be tempted to try us. Temptation is a trial for us. It's a trial of our sincerity if we back up what we say we believe. When a person is gripped by greed for wealth, then he or she experiences the grief of greed. That person invites trials into his or her life. It's like, it's like a mother who yells out the door to her children at dinner time and says, Come and get it! The difference is the greedy, grasping person is yelling out the door to twins known as trouble and misery and shouts, Come and get me! That's what we do when we're in the grasp of greed. The quest to gain wealth at any cost leads to temptations to do wrong to gain it. And temptations, once you get it, the, the conscience of the person is bound by chains, gagged and locked into the dark closet of the mind. It, the conscience is stifled, it's suppressed, it's smothered, and it's suffocated. Common sense and wisdom are muffled because the person has become fixated and, fo and focused on himself and his riches. He has become excited, thrilled, and intoxicated by the prospects of the power, the popularity, and possessions that he can purchase by having riches. His heartbeat races and his breathing becomes heavy as he pants for the gold, the silver, the money, and the possessions that he desires. The consequences of sinful choices that are made to hoard wealth lead to future misery in his or her life. Wealth and possessions can grip a person's heart so tight that he cannot think straight at all and he cannot discern what is important. Consider the story uh, that is told of a successful young yuppie businessman who was out for a Saturday drive in the mountains near his very spacious house. He hit the accelerator on his convertible BMW and let the breeze blow in his hair backward. But he lost control of the car and it rolled down a mountain throwing himself from the car. Onlookers quickly called the police who rushed to the scene finding the fellow stumbling around and looking below at his wrecked car. The police reported that the man was bleeding profusely and he was muttering, Oh no! No! My car is ruined! A policeman chastised the man and said, You silly yuppie. All you care about is your car and you don't even notice that your left arm has been severed and is missing. The yuppie mourned again. 
Oh, no! Not my Rolex, too! You know, folks, that guy had a problem for sure. When people... (laughs) When people pursue riches at any cost, no matter what happens, they must answer the questions that say, what are you willing to do to get your wealth? What compromises will you make to get it? Money has a way of becoming a barrier to your Christian growth or having a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you're not careful. It can cause people to do the most foolish things. For example, some time ago, CNN carried a report of a man who was rushed to the emergency room of Colette General Hospital in western France. He was suffering from severe stomach pain. Doctors were awed when they viewed the man's x-rays. This man had an enormous opaque mass in his stomach. It weighed 12 pounds. It was as much as a bowling ball in his stomach. And it was so heavy, it forced his stomach down between his hips. That's how bad the stomach sagged. The man who had a history of major psychiatric illness, he had swallowed 350 coins worth $650 along with assorted pieces of jewelry. So the doctors opened his stomach and removed the contents, but he died 12 days later from complications. As grotesque as that sounds, the same illness is afflicting millions of people in another sense. A a craving, a craving for money can clog our souls with tragic results. It's money, it's that love of money that is the root of all evil. It's not the money, it's the love of it. You know, in their book, The Day America Told the Truth, author James Patterson and Peter Kim revealed some shocking statistics on how far people in this country would go and what they would be willing to do for money. When asked what they would do for $10 million, here were the responses to the survey. 25% said they would abandon their entire family for 10 million bucks. They would just forsake their family, 25%. 23% they would become prostitutes for a week or more. 16% says they would give up their American citizenship for 10 million dollars. 16% said they would leave their spouses. 10% said they would withhold withhold testimony and let a murderer go free. 7% said they would kill a stranger. 3% said they would put their children up for adoption. As one cynic put it, everyone has their price. As the above survey indicates, some people will sell just about anything to gain riches. God help us to love the Lord Jesus Christ more than anything else in this world. And and protect us. God help us and protect us from the grasp of greed. May we realize that money can be a great blessing, a great tool of blessing, but it can also destroy our lives. Let's pray.